So our last presenter before the lunch break is Archie Mitra, Senior Director of Machine Learning at BuzzFeed. Archie will present his talk about operationalizing Gen AI at BuzzFeed. And yes, after this, we'll take a 45-minute lunch break. That's a great opportunity to check out the sponsor tables, set up some additional speed meetings, all while enjoying a delicious lunch. So I hope all of you joining us virtually also have some excellent food waiting for you as well. Maybe it's microwave, maybe it's delivery. That's up to you guys. Uh, so now let's welcome Archie to the stage. Mic test, mic test. I've been asked to eat the mic, so let's see. Is it eating enough? I think so, okay. Uh, well, thanks, um, Sam, for, for the great introduction, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, given the apocalyptic climate yesterday around New York, I really appreciate all of you guys being here. Um, so, you know, Gen AI has been branded a revolutionary technology um, some comparing it to a nuclear weapon, while others comparing it to the invention of the computers itself. Every social media, every news cycle, in every corner of the internet, you can see you know, pretty exciting, disruptive capabilities of generative AI on one hand, and you know, frightening, um, sometimes funny failure states you know, on the other hand. And both of them have contributed to a situation where it's chaotic, it's messy, it's very overwhelming for somebody trying to try to operationalize Gen AI at their organization, at their company. So today, I want to briefly talk about how at BuzzFeed we have operationalized Gen AI, kind of the lessons we have learned, kind of the steps we have taken in helping um, get oper uh, Gen AI operationalized. Um, and specifically for content experimentation. And so experimentation, is at the heart of BuzzFeed. And so it'll be surprising for some of you guys to know, we started our Gen AI first experiment back in July 2021. And back then, there was, Gen AI just wasn't a thing. And so we used CycleGans to launch this first quiz where you could take a quiz and find your soulmate. And I was using CycleGan to generate a soulmate for you. Um, fast forward to, I think, end of last year when um, ChatGPT made Gen AI mainstream and caused a Cambrian explosion in that space. Um, right after John Aperity, founder and CEO of BuzzFeed, said a very bold vision to say, we'll use AI to create content that wasn't possible before AI. And so as a first experiment to that kind of bold vision, we launched Infinity Quizzes, a reinvention of a classic BuzzFeed content format where using LLMs, you could generate infinite amount of results, kind of driving retakes and driving time spent. And since then, um, we have just accelerated our content experimentation with generative AI, um, launching a plethora of, of content. I'm not gonna talk through all of them, just highlight the last two. Um, in May 2023, we launched Botatui, which is a domain-aware LLM that can answer any food-related question you have or uh, recommend tasty recipes to you for you to cook at home. And the last one uh, was a Nipogachi, uh, which is a chatbot game um, that where you raise a Nipo baby. If you don't know what a Nipo baby is, I didn't either. I would encourage you to go <laughs> check it out. Um, Clearly not something, an idea that came from me. Um, at the bottom, you see a couple of things that we have done uh, using generative AI um, to help with operations within the company. Um, so we have chatbots that helps our sales teams, and then we also have AI helping us generate SEO titles. And I'll speak to more of these in, in a bit. If I can move forward. Nope, back. Sorry. Nope. Two back. Sorry, that's a meme. And so I know I spent some time you know, self-promoting all the stuff that we have done with Giant AI, um, but you know, memes are a, a way of life at Westfield, so I had to squeeze one in. Um, but yeah, let's, let's look at how we have been able to 
operationalized GNAI adverse feed. So we've already looked at the timeline of our content experimentation, but we'll dive into how we have done it in three steps of how did we democratize it, how did we educate people who wanted to use it, and how we have done um, scaled experimentation with that. And then in the last, we'll kind of look at a case study of Botatui on how all three of them kind of came together um, to get us out there. And so kind of the first step that we did was to democratize the technology, get in the hands of creative people. And when I say creative people, at BuzzFeed, that's not, not just you know, writers and editors, but your product managers, your product designers, even engineers, we really, really trust the creative instinct everybody has across the company. And creativity and ideas can come from anywhere. So the first step we took was to give everybody access to the playgrounds they wanted. Maybe that's a third party playground, like an open AI playground where you can go try out how that looks like. When we saw there was some interest in uh, generative images, we um, deployed our own diffuser model in-house and, and made that available as a Slack bot for people to use and experiment and get ideas from it. Um, get the technology in the hands of people who are using existing tools. So we integrated uh, generative AI into our CMS. So you can go into our CMS and try our AI prompt and see what it responds, use it as a brainstorming tool. Um, not only restricting to you know, what existed already, but also be proactive and reactive with, with building prototypes. So here you see Jin in my team uh, get excited about Google's Palm 2 launch and be like, oh, you know what? I'm gonna put that into a collab notebook, share it with people and see if there's something we can build with it. Um, quite immediately, I guess, like you know, three days after it was announced. And the last, we empowered every team across the company to use any API they wanted as long as they followed a few rules, and the rules were you gotta emit the cost uh, that your app is using, uh, how much token it's using, what is the latency, and then we accumulated all of that into an org-wide dashboard that we can keep a track of so that we know what services we are using, how we are using it. So that was the first step, you know, get it in the hands of people who want to use it and come up with creative ideas. The next step is to then educate them and tell them how this technology works under the hood. Um, so we did a ton of demystifying AI talks. There were, I guess, 20, 200 plus signups um, for those conversations. Um, and then we created AI office hours. That's a weekly office hour that anybody can come to across the company, talk about their AI ideas. It could be as simple as, oh, I've been using um, this to write a reply to my email, but the prompt's not working right. Can you help me uh, make the prompt better? Or could be as complicated as, oh, I have this huge spreadsheet that I get from my client. I have to understand this, and I have to derive insights, and that takes me a lot of time. I've seen these cool demos on, on Twitter. How can I make that, or how can I use that in-house? And we see about 10 plus signups um, for those AI office hours. And the third one, um, and this is a pretty interesting one, which grew kind of organically, is to have Gen AI workshops and guidelines. And these are not delivered by you know, the machine learning team or even the tech team. These were people who were super users of generative AI from getting um, benefited from the democratization we did earlier and be like, you know what, this is super cool. I wanna help my team also do the stuff that I'm doing. And so really p empowering them and helping them create these guidelines, create these uh, workshops for them made it a huge success because people in their teams were like, oh, somebody in my team's using it, so it's not that hard, it's not that frightening, I can use it too, and they would then start using it. And the last one I just do, I wanted to highlight was uh, we created an AI help Slack channel, again, org -wide. anybody who wants to use it, sales, legal, um, content, creative, you know, um, um, uh, engineers, anybody can come in and ask a question and get help and get supported. So the last step, once you have democratized it and got people educated on how to use it, was to run scaled experiments. So the way I like to look at it is kind of in two parts. There's a production build part and then there's a model alignment or prompt testing part. And I'll speak to why I see them as two different parts. Production build part, very similar to you know, your software systems, how you wanna think about it. You develop a flexible system design, you incorporate models and logic, you load test it, recall, emit org-wide metrics, and you red team it. Red teaming is really the 
new aspect that's been added into how would you do software development um, because these LLM or generative AI models are, have their mind of their own. You cannot kind of control how they behave. So really reteaming it from all sorts of direction can help us kind of align it to our values, BuzzFeed's values and BuzzFeed's content needs before we put that in front of the users. Um, and then on the other end though, when we are thinking about how do we align the model or prompt testing, you don't need to be wait till your production build is complete. So we run that parallelly, um, and that looks a very iterative process that you know, machine learning teams work with product teams and content teams to first determine what kind of desired behaviors we want out of this um, content or out of this model, and how can we limit the undesired behavior we would see um, from these models, and then work iteratively to try to cover for those. Some of those solutions could be machine learning driven, could also be um, editorial driven where, where they're like, oh, we, this failure is actually funny. Why not we make it as a fun or we position this content as a, to highlight that funniness of this uh, failure state. Uh, or could be even design or product um, solutions. So working really iteratively with them in an environment that's not too heavy. So, you know, I, I put the collab notebook um, um, logo there to kind of identify. We do a lot of that just using on a collab notebook. We have um, encouraged editors and, and writers and our product teams to know how to use collab notebooks and very easy. And you can kind of iterate through that fairly quickly without having to wait to build out an entire production um, system. And so to summarize, what are the org needs, right? The org needs was to democratize this technology, educate them, and then run scaled experiments. And the actions we took to democratize was to provide low effort access to any and all Gen AI capabilities. We educated them by demystifying Gen AI, supported super users, and highlighted uh, limitations. And then while we were doing scaled experiments, we built and buy systems with tight feedback loop with creatives, designers, and, and product managers. And so let's look at how all of these kind of three steps came together to build Botatui. And so it started when the, on, on the left top where the product manager of Tasty got access to GPT and was super excited. He's like, oh, uh, I got access to chat GPT. I asked it to recommend some recipes and it did a really good job. And it even recommended a Tasty recipe to me. Um, and then I kept asking it, more tasty recipes, and it was able to, able to recommend me tasty recipes, and did a pretty decent job. Although, you know, the links were kind of broken that it shared, and the uh, recipes were a little old. And I'm like, oh yeah, that's cool. Um, do you think this is useful to our users? And I'm like, yeah, this would be a compelling use case for our users who would be able to you know, have a chatbot to answer complicated cooking questions and ask like, you know, what can I make with these ingredients and stuff like that. So then I was like, oh, you know what? Um, LLMs can be made domain aware. Um, there's some really um, cutting edge uh, techniques that are coming out to help with that. Um, why don't we build a playground for you super quick and send that over to you and see how you like it? And so we built a playground super quickly based on our, some of the work we had done with um, recommending tasty recipes in the past and, and send that to the PM. And the PM was like, oh, you know what? The playground works really, really well and, and it'll be a very compelling feature. Let's try to bring that to production. Um, but it, it does have a few failure states. You know, it tries to recommend when I'm asking it, you know, is water wet? It recommends me some drinks. And so that's not a failure state we want out of uh, to, to show our users. So how do we can align that? So from there, we went to kind of like educating what does it mean to build with a, a, a domain aware LLM. And so the first one was, you know, what he had already experienced, which was LLMs have a data recency problem. And so ChatGPT, which was trained till 2021, could recommend tasty recipes because it had crawled and trained on it from 2021 and didn't have a notion of all the recent recipes that we had published. The second one, it loves to hallucinate. So when you ask it for, hey, can you give me a link? It just hallucinates a link and gives that to you, which actually doesn't work. And so then the next step was to educate them on the reason and act and semantic search framework. I'm not gonna go too deep into that. I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen similar systems in Twitter. If you haven't, I'll encourage you to just go to Twitter, search for Langchain, and you'd see like 10,000 posts in the last one hour. Um, and so kind of like educating them how that works. Um, and then 
talking to them about the economics of it, where if you were to use reason and act, every reasoning step, if it uses a LLM, would cost more in terms of latency, in terms of tokens. And then the idea is the more you reason with an LLM, the more tokens you would have, and so the more costly it would become. So kind of hitting that right balance, and obviously the concept of red teaming and model alignment, which is fairly new to a lot of people, including even us, and something that we are learning how to do better. And so from there, the last step obviously then is to build a scaled experiment with it. I know it's a system design diagram which looks a little bit complicated. So every system design diagram looks like that, but I'll walk you through it and it'll, make all, it'll all make sense. So from um, left to right, so you have a user that comes in um, to, um, to the Tasty app, opens a bot Atui, and maybe it asks a question like, hey, I want to make meat dishes um, under 30 minutes, but I don't like chicken, right? And that's a very complicated user prompt that we have to somehow figure out what to do with. What happens is it goes into something we like to call our policy, and the policy looks at that and uses the reasoning steps, which under the hood uses some classification models um, um, uh, built in-house and, and LLM itself to determine and understand what the user is looking for. Once it has determined, oh, the user is looking for um, you know, meat recipes under 30 minutes, it now tries to determine, oh, should we recommend tasty recipes to this user, and which tasty recipe should we recommend? And at that point, it goes um, to our semantic search, which you see up there on top to our nearest neighbor search, where it says, I should look for quick beef recipes or pork recipes under 30 minutes. So what it has done now, it has reformulated the question or the prompt that the user asked into something a little bit simpler that a semantic system can understand. So spend a little bit time on the, on the top part of this. Um, if I could, oh yeah, I can do a pointer, very nice. And so uh, we get the t our tasty recipes, we um, use an in-house embedding model that was trained to do tasty recommendations, but we have fine-tuned that to be able to handle semantic search. And so it, it creates an uh, embedding of our entire tasty data set, and then we use third-party um, um, nearest neighbor search hosting tools like Pinecone or GCP matching engine to host those embeddings. And so that when the policy comes around with to say, hey, quick, easy beef recipes or uh, pork recipes under 30 minutes, it does a, uh, a nearest neighbor search, gets the uh, set of recommendations from it. Um, there's some more science there that I'm gonna not talk about and then take those recipes and the question that the user asked and then try to take an action with that and then that uses uh, an LLM under the hood. Right now you, you use a chat GPT, but there's no reason uh, that we need to use chat GPT. And then that gets recommended to the user. Um, so what I wanted to highlight is there are now three problems we're trying to solve with this, right? So the first problem is query understanding. What is the user looking for? Now, in a traditional search engine, when you say query understanding, there's only just one query that you need to understand. But in the chat format, the query understanding is more longer term because let's go with the same example that I was using before. Uh, the user asks, well, like, oh, can I uh, recommend me some uh, meat recipes uh, under 30 minutes, but I don't like chicken. The bot recommends some you know, pork and beef recipes and the, um, um, the user's like, oh, um, I really like the second recipe. Can you tell me the ingredients of it? Now, the query that you have to understand needs to have the context of the previous question it had, as well as the response that you gave. And so the query understanding problem is a little bit different than what you would see in a standard um, um, uh, search engine. And from there, just understanding the query is not enough you need to reformulate the query. So for example, if you're just taking the previous prompt that the user had, which is like, you know, I want uh, meat recipes uh, under 30 minutes, uh, but I don't like chicken, and then use just a nearest neighbor search, you'll most likely just get chicken recipes, which is not what the user wants. So you have to reformulate that. You have to reformulate that to be, oh, the user doesn't like chicken, but want meat recipes, so I should search for meat alternative recipes, so that could be you know, pork recipes or beef recipes. So that's the second kind of a problem that we're trying to solve, which is a query reformulation. And the third one, which I think is the only real 
LLM alignment problem that is new and, and did not exist, um, let's say a year back, is to how does the model align to the behaviors we want. So for example, one behavior would be we don't want to answer anything uh, with this particular chatbot that is not related to food or not related to recipes. How can we achieve that? How can we achieve a situation where if a user asks for more than three recipes, it can recommend more than three recipes? Or uh, if the user says, oh, can you give me some um, um, desert options that pair well with it, it can identify that, oh, it's looking for deserts that parallel with the previous question. So those are like alignment problems that are new and, and something that we are working on solving. And so that's why the, the title of this um, uh, slide says, existing men, are these new problems or are these just you know, machine learning problems that are masquerading or traditional machine learning problems that have been well studied, well researched, um, masquerading as LLM problems? I think that is it. Thanks for joining.